All right, welcome everyone. Uh, welcome to Alphabets, a weekly conversation typically focused on small to mid cap companies where we seek to discover the key drivers behind a business success. My name is Nathan. I'm joined today by Pat Connolly, our resident stock detective, Ross Klein, the CIO of ChangeBridge Capital, David Bastian of Kingdom Capital, and, and Michael Toprick, the CEO of Mechanical Technology. Thanks everyone for being here today. So I wanted to start off actually, Michael, just to set the ground, let people know, you know what mechanical technology does. I think uh, maybe the best place to start is how did Brookstone become involved with mechanical technology um, and give us some background there. Great. First, I want to flash up a commercial. I think as of tomorrow, our name will be changing to Saluna Holdings Saluna. and we're going to have a new ticker SLNH. So I need to get that out there so everybody knows that that's out there. Um, then uh, very quickly, how did Brookstone get involved? I'd say about five years ago, um, we were looking to invest in companies that had net operating losses and mechanical technologies had a great analytical instruments business which had, which had been an underperformer, it was losing a little bit of money. And they uh, spun off a company called Plug Power, which was in the, um, in the fuel cell business, which was a multi-billion dollar success. And I believe they had some other businesses and they generated through that process, they were doing some research to generate $50 million in net operating losses. So we made an investment thinking that this would be a great acquisition platform. Over time, we had looked to acquire a whole series of other companies. I was extremely involved with that as well, my, as well as my partners were. And slowly it became obvious to us that there was an opportunity not to acquire a business, but to actually build a business that um, we had um, I would say view into through another portfolio of ours called Saluna. And um, we started modestly. We, we paid for a small facility up in Washington state we had Saluna manage that for us. And it was a huge success within 12 months. We got all our capital back. And I think that this December will be um, 18 months since we've been in it and we've, double our money so far. So it's been a fabulous investment. And as that was proceeding along, it became clear that um, the returns on invested capital in that business were tremendous, almost unparalleled compared to anything I'd seen before as a professional investor. And not only that, it's, it's one thing to get returns on invested capital if you can invest $10, or $100, or $100,000. It's, it's very nice, but it's, it's not the same as being able to say, hey, I could take tens of millions or hundreds of millions of dollars put our um, capital discipline onto how that money is invested and really do really well for our investors. And so we began the transition from uh, an analytical instruments company into a you know, cryptocurrency company. And really, I think, that you know, we've uh, communicated to the marketplace that we're transitioning away from the, uh, the analytical instruments business and are likely going to do something strategic with that in the next call three to six months. And so hence, we decided to bring Saluna in-house instead of having them be an out-of-house contractor. And as, as a consequence of that, got about 300 megawatts of pipeline to build out that they have under LOI. And I will tell you that with that addition and completion of that transaction, we are really quite different than most cryptocurrency guys. We are solutions providers to the energy, especially renewable energy sector. And to the extent that um, there are wind or solar plants that are not selling all the power that they generate, we have an ability to help them monetize that power um, and dramatically change the economics of their projects. And one of the projects we already have up and running right now is one where the utility asked us to locate right next to its substation to help us to help us help them balance their load on their grid because they're putting so many renewables onto uh, onto their system. So really, big picture, you need to view us as complementing the up and coming renewable sector in this country until it moves from you know single double digits to a, a you know 20 25 percent of the of the grid the only way to do that is in conjunction with some sort of 
off-taker right on their property. And the easiest off-taker is dispatchable flexible computing, which crypto is. We are that solution. We work with power producers and utilities to help them put renewables onto the grid. That's really what people are buying into when they buy us. That's how we can create this pipeline. We're not chasing PPAs. You know, we have investors saying, well, show me your PPAs. I mean, I can show you our arrangements with power producers. That's fine. But we don't have a, we take or pay arrangement because we're not buying, we're not running around trying to buy power from somebody. We are having power producers call us with, we have a problem, help us. That's what we do. Thanks so much for that. Jumping right in, Ross, I'm going to hand it off to you for the first question. Yeah, um, thanks for the time today, Michael. It's My uh, pleasure. Thank you, Rob. Um, I, I think some of the viewers would benefit from sort of a simple breakdown of the economics of the business. And so as we sort of, we, we, we do our best to try to break things down as simply as possible. Okay. The, the metrics that I would imagine being most relevant are sort of a contribution margin per megawatt. And if we could sort of break that out by, you know, Bitcoin is the largest uh, mining source of revenue for us. If we could just break it out by sort of Bitcoin 60, 40, 20,000, and then do the same if possible on a CapEx per megawatt. Sure. Um, I, I am going to get these numbers approximately correct. Perfect. And um, I, I first want to refer people to our website because we disclose every month contribution margin by location. So I have to pull these numbers from memory, but if people really care, you can see monthly numbers by location on the site. So I stand corrected by everything on our website. That's the real number. Sure. Um, and so um, the cash contribution margins, I'm just going to speak generally, have ranged over the past several months for us from 65 to 75%. And I'll tell you why there's a certain flux in our numbers. And it's very interesting because certain astute investors picked up on this. Our number one criteria for developing pipeline is 2.5 cents power or less per kilowatt hour. That's important and wasn't pulled out of the air because if you had that power cost during the last crypto winter, you still made money. Very important to us. And for example, one of our sites gives us 83 or 84% uptime at two, an average of 2.3 cents over the course of the year. Actually, some months are at one point something. It, it, that, that's the average. It, it goes up and down. But if we want to run that extra 17%, we have a penalty rate that pushes our, our power cost up because the utility doesn't really want us to do that. So in right now, at crypto the way it is, I'm running 100%. So my margin is compromised. So investors, and I put out a scenario breakdown of our profitability by 25, 45, and 60,000. And they said, why are your margins similar at 45 versus 25? And I said, 45, I'm paying the penalty rate. Sure. But it's but at, at, at 25, I'm at I'm at 83% and, and I'm not paying the penalty rate. And that's why you'll see. You know, why are our margins, you know, 90% now and, you know, under this typical scenario of 25,000, aren't they like 45 or 50% under that? Because I don't mind the, the small penalty on the upside I'm paying to give me sleep at night insurance that this business can be profitable through all crypto cycles. And that's very much what we're focused on. So that's the kind of range. And if investors want the exact numbers, they're really on our website. That makes sense. And and if we think about that in terms of an actual dollar amount, um, just on a per megawatt hour, I know hash rates change and there are a number of variables. Uh, on a per megawatt, I honestly don't remember that. It's all in our numbers. I, I release so many operating statistics. I, I don't remember per megawatt. I, I honestly, I live in eight dollars. And so I care about how many dollars we made that month contribution margin dollars. We convert all our crypto to dollars. And so I live in eat cash contribution margin and I, I look at I look at dollars and um, our megawatts, I 
I, I just don't remember the number per megawatt offhand. Okay, we can dig that up. Um, and, and then in terms of capex, so you've given a you've given some color somewhere between you know million and a half, two million, two and a half million per megawatt to to build it out. Um, how do we view that in terms of first of all, is that an approximate number that we should be using? The numbers I put out are approximately right. They fluctuate. I mean, I know that we just built capacity at two hundred fifty thousand dollars per megawatt, but we're looking at building out more capacity that'll be closer to three fifty, just because electrical gear has gotten more expensive. And I know that, um, yeah, I, I I don't remember exactly, but the numbers I gave in terms of the equipment cost or the machine cost per megawatt, I think it's uh, you know three hundred you know petahash of of S nineteens are out there per megawatt. And so it depends on, and it's a funny thing because you can say, well, I can buy an S19 for delivery in six months for $6,000. Yes, but you have to almost prepay for all of that. So if you paid 11,000 for an S19, you can plug in now, you could probably, by the time you took delivery of that, have made at least six to $7,000. And so it's a funny thing how much you pay because it, it really it's it's how do you use your cash and right. so you hear guys saying i got an s19 for four thousand i'm taking delivery in 2023 all right great but you already parted with most of that cash and so if you had that cash and could plug it in somewhere you would not for sure but you might be very much better off paying the 11 on the spot market and generating all that cash and you may have even repaid the the entire piece of the equipment by the time you would have taken delivery. So, um, and then useful life. Uh, how should we sort of view that in terms of new uh, equipment? That's a hard question, Ross, because these machines, properly taken care of, can last a very long time. And now, I'm going to define last as being able to be turned on and functioning. So, let's take that a step deeper. Okay, you have to turn on and function and make money. And so it depends on your power cost. If you have a four cent power cost and hash rate keeps climbing and the next thing out there is the neck is the S23. And you say to yourself, wow, my S19s are making me less and less money. My power cost is high. I got to get myself the S22s, 23s, whatever they're introducing and get rid of these S19s. Whereas if I've got two and a half cent or 2.3 cent power cost, I'll buy your old S19s for that fire sale price, plug them in because I can make a fair amount of money with them. And so useful life depends on useful to whom at what power cost. A higher power cost shortens the useful life to you but not of the machine because you obviously can sell it for a real amount of money. It's, it's worth something because there's a, a global distribution of power costs from, you know, six cents to one cent. And so machines, it's like in the U S people typically buy new cars and where do all the new cars go that are, that are returned on lease in the U S they go to South America, other like, and so it's, there's this migration of, of equipment down the chain from high cost guys to lower cost guys. And we're able to get very good returns on invested capital. So we actually run a mix of cutting edge and second and third gen equipment. Um, that's, that's what we're looking at, at doing. And we're opportunistic. You know, Bitmain has a, has a, you know, some contract fell off and they need to get rid of something. We're there. Or during the China unplugging, I bought four spot delivery, not as many as I'd like, but a whole bunch of S19 J's for 5,300 a piece. Mm. People got nervous. So, you know, and spot market is, you know, eight, nine, 10, 11, depending on where you're buying from. So it's, we basically average in over time is what we've done for the facilities we're going to build out next year. Since we already know our needs for delivery are April, May, June, July, August, you know, we have, we're, we're probably on average going to build up 25 megawatts a quarter um, next year. 
So given that we know that, um, we can put in advanced delivery orders with certain manufacturers and attempt to take advantage of the forward market. So we didn't really do that with our current facilities because these were the first facilities we were building. Really wanted to make sure they came up, you know, on time. And it's it's not good if you take delivery of equipment and you don't have a place to put it. That's money lost every day. Right. So that that makes a lot of sense. Um, and thanks for that, Color. Recognizing that it's variable and it depends on you know Bitcoin prices, hash rates, energy costs. Um, how do we sort of think about the need to consume capital, right? So yeah. 30 million on the balance sheet now, give or take. And Ross, this is a problem that I think about consistently. And um, I put myself in the shoes of, if I were on the outside attempting to analyze the free cash flows of this company, what information do I need? And so, as we bring up our two facilities, quote, by the end of Q1 next year, they'll be quote unquote mature where every slot will be filled because we're still sort of building them up and rolling on. So as of, as of Q1 next year, right? And so I will communicate to the marketplace a range of dollars that they should budget for each facility in what I call maintenance capex. By that, I mean, you know, every quarter will, depending on market conditions, we're mentally budgeting this amount to swap out old equipment and buy new equipment. And at the end of the quarter, we'll say, hey, you know, we we didn't spend that because we didn't feel like we needed to, or we overspent, but we'll underspend next quarter. We knew, do need that market flexibility, but we will put that out there. I am thinking, but this is just preliminary thoughts, that, you know, 10 to 15% of the EBITDA generation of each facility will be somewhere in the range of what we do. Um, but I'm going to get, give very specific guidance on that and budget reporting, because if you haven't seen the reporting that we put out there every quarter, we put out a tracker on our mature facilities of capital invested in capital return, because we want investors to see by location, how much money has gone in and how much money has gone out. And we report on that. So I'm not reporting on it on our two facilities that are scaling up because they're in a scale up phase. But once we're done scaling them, then you'll see the curve of how much has gone in and how much has come out. And you'll see when's the break even, when have they gotten all our capital out and when it, and when, and just what's the, basically this business is one of shepherding capital, cost of capital, managing capital properly as an important component for driving shareholder returns. And I believe in reporting that on a per facility basis, you can see exactly how we're doing. Okay, that's helpful. Um, as we sort of think about, you know, building up 25 million megawatts a quarter next year, and there's another, you know, 50, I think that you have in the closer term pipeline. That's a lot of capital that, that needs to be spent. That's, you know, 150, 200, 300 million, potentially. It, where would you ideally like that to come from, right? Because the debt markets are expensive for your business your stock is cheaper than its peers. How do you sort of view? Well, we were very fortunate that we just recently did an equity raise or a convertible debt raise with some warrants that struck well above market. And I have put out when I, when I did that raise that we are likely to look at project specific debt okay, and equipment financing. So that's debt. We're likely to look at a preferred issue which we've successfully raised before. And that's, you know, paper that investors are very comfortable with and we're very comfortable we can we can pay the preferred dividend on. That's very good paper to own. And then I have what I call project equity partnerships, where, for example, we have commitments from institutional investors to invest in the equity of a project where they say, we're giving you, you know, $10 million, return that 10 million plus a hurdle rate, and then we go 50, 50 after that. And so I see us in the business of monetizing our intellectual property. And that's very much of, we can help energy companies. And so taking on project specific equity to do that, um, is, is one way to 
build out capacity, solve people's problems, and not dilute our equity. Because as you can imagine, our firm controls plus or minus 30% of the equity of the common equity. We have very little interest in diluting the common equity of this company just to build out projects. And I don't need to just blow up the balance sheet and do like some others have issued. You start out the year with 10 million shares and you end up with 100 million shares. And that's the, my mind, wrong way to grow your market cap. Hard to argue. Um, that makes a lot of sense. I, in, I'll, I'll, I'll pause on some of the financial questions. I, I'd love to get a better understanding of sort of how this load instability at the utility level works and, and, and how you're able to sort of resolve some of that issue from them, you know, from a sustainability. Yeah, I'll start with the the most interesting one, which we're uh, going to commence construction on this thing called Project Dorothy. Um, there you have a, uh, a wind facility that um, is generating power that it, it's curtailed. It really can't sell. And it has a, it's about, uh, I think it's 150, 200 megawatt wind plant, a uh, wind power plant that um, is doing okay financially, but could be doing much better. And so we're co-locating onto their facility, onto their grounds, buying power from them. And at the same time, to the extent we need more power, we can take some off the grid. But given our modeling, we'll probably take call it 60 to 75% of our power will be bought from the wind farm. And the remainder will be bought from the grid to just fill us in so that we can keep running when the wind isn't blowing and they don't have extra to sell us. So that's a huge win-win because we're enabling, I mean, if you think about it, de novo, if you have a site for a wind project and, and someone say, you know, I'm a little worried. I can't sell all the power there. It's, it's a marginal project, but you know, we want to get more renewables on the grid, put my hand up and say, Hey, if you have extra power, I'll buy it from you. That gets more wind projects built. But as we've gotten our message out, you'd be surprised at the incoming calls from utilities and, and uh, independent power producers that we've gotten that we have a problem. Um, help us. There are just so many, especially wind projects that are underperforming all over the world, not just in the US. And so we have active discussions in Europe and Asia, all around the world to, to solve these problems. That's why when you look at our business model, we can really scale. And if we can't provide the capital to a project because we can't blow up our balance sheet, we have the ability to very simply get project debt project equity, making half the profits of the project would come to us without putting in any capital. Um, I think we'd always put in some capital, but it's, if the question is, Michael, you know, this could be, you know, you know, gigawatts of opportunity in the next five years. Yes, but there is a way to do that. Um, that doesn't involve blowing us up. And if you take a look at like the, you know, like Brookfield Asset Management, for example, they have parts of their company that, they own companies outright and other parts of the company they manage money on behalf of investors. And some projects we're going to own hundred percent of, some will own less than hundred percent of. It just depends on where we were in our capital cycle when the project opportunity came up. So we're a solutions provider making money as a principal, not as a consultant is the way you need to see it. Okay. That makes a lot of sense. Um, so effectively it, it sounds like the utilities are, are handcuffed when some of these alternative sources, renewable sources of energy come on in, in ways that it, it creates imbalances in what they can take on. Is that sort of a yeah. simplistic way to... Well, I mean, it's, it's not simplistic. It's the truth. Because when the wind blows, some places have too much power. I mean, Germany has negative rates for 100, 120 days a year. They've got too much power sitting there and they don't know what to do with it. So... You put more renewables on the grid, you're going to get negative energy prices. Okay, interesting. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm. I think this has been incredibly helpful. I'd love to, you know, see if, if Pat or, or, or David want to jump in and ask anything. Yeah, I'd love to throw over to David for next questions if you've got any. Sure. So, Mike, one thing I think that would be helpful for people. Uh, we're talking about kind of the advantage you had in terms of how you are pursuing 
getting more miners on the grid versus some of your peers. Uh, this summer when a lot of miners came off the, uh, off the grid in China and moved over here, um, the competition we were seeing for plugs um, for what you're pursuing compared to a lot of other miners. Yeah, I mean, we have plugs. I mean, we have inquiries and from um, power producers and we're solving their problems. So we, we will have plugs and this, um, this great unplugging in China you know, our phone rang off the hook and we, we cut a joint venture with a company in China that it's not large. They, we, we gave them 10 megawatts of our, um, of our capacity and we're, we're almost done scaling them up. I think we're two thirds of the way done scaling them up. But the deal was they pay for our people, they pay for our power and give us a meaningful percentage of the revenue. And if you take a look at that and we disclose this in our numbers, we break out the separate sort of JV hosting p l within 12 months plus or minus that pays for the entire cost of our 10 megawatts of infrastructure that we're doing it's, it's a one-year payback on on what they're giving us for that infrastructure which is an outstanding deal so we're not quote unquote in the hosting business but when an opportunity arises for us to get that kind of return on invested capital we'll take it anytime and um, increasingly plugs are scarce. We have inquiries, but not at this price level. So right now I, I say we don't have any um, hot discussions with other companies for more of these JVs, but that's not to say that that can't change. Perfect. David, you have any other follow-up questions? I think that, that was the uh, main thing I wanted to cover on the, the plug side, so I'll turn it over to you now. Perfect. So we got about five minutes left. Uh, Pat, I've got, I'll let you jump in with a question. I've got one, and then uh, we'll let you go. We just want to say thanks so much for your time. Okay, so um, it sounds like almost every energy producer has the problem of excess power. So would you say it's like a long-term tailwind if more and more people get solar power and more decentralized power that these renewable facilities will become okay. more access power? Let me parse this out. As more renewable energy is being put on the grid globally, the problem gets increasingly acute and multiplied. Because when the sun shines, it sun shines for everybody in an area. When the wind blows, it blows for everybody in an area. Um, one way to solve this is to have um, better interconnects between the network of sort of small grids we have in this country. We don't have a national grid. And so what happens is there's too much wind in a certain part of the country. They can't ship the power across the country. That's a problem. That's what causes negative prices in a specific area and just curtailment, just don't send us the power. So I expect that that problem will only increase and provide us with a greater market opportunity. Microgrids is a little bit, I'm sorry, distributed sort of um, use of uh, renewable energy is a little different because they're, they're thinking that I view that and maybe this wasn't your question that more you know putting solar on your rooftop like the users just try to generate as much power as they can from their own uses uh, for, for their own use that ha that has less effect on us it's more the industrial scale guys that are in certain areas that that really creates the opportunity for us any follow-up questions there Pat I'm, not, I was just, I'm glad to hear it's like a growing problem and it's a growing solution. That's all like that. Sounds good. Well, I'll go ahead and uh, finish it off with actually a question a bit more tailored for kind of a newer investor who may not have uh, invested in Bitcoin mining before. Uh, and a lot of times the big question in this space is, if you look at the other Bitcoin miners, they all have lawsuits, right? They're um, awash in... Uh, regulatory problems and so we know that you're different but I just wanted to get it from you how would you explain to a new investor how you are different from some of these other Bitcoin miners that have a lot of problems <laughs> playing them um, I think the problems that you're referring to are like class action shareholder lawsuits and things like that um, look as part of the uh, capitalist system in the United States, it's not a matter of 
you know, if, but when those people come my way. Um, and But we are extraordinarily careful uh, in what we do. And I like to think I'm qualified in the way I speak. And we're transparent and accountable and we release information every month. Every month I tell you pretty much everything I know about the business that's relevant. But also, I don't tell you things that I don't want competitors to know, but it's a total information dump. And if I release things on the 10th, on the 11th, I don't have any shockingly private information. And so, but if you're only really releasing important information every quarter, every release is monumental and can move the stock. And every and we're, we're almost in the mode of continuous information flow. And so this whole thing of, you know, you lied to investors, you didn't disclose. I'm disclosing all the time. Maybe not real time, but pretty close. And I would hope that I do that in a qualified, intelligent way where that perhaps insulates me from having to deal with these class action suits. But I will tell you, it's just part of the system. These There are firms that make their living doing that. And I would say that as my market cap gets higher, I become a bigger target for that. So do I want these lawsuits? No. Am I probably going to get one? Yes. But I believe we're transparent, accountable, and and really communicating with investors in a way that few others in the sector do. And I think that provides us with insulation against these firms. And I think it speaks a lot that you're the only one in that group that doesn't have one of those lawsuits right now. So uh, I think that you're being quite effective there. So thank you so much okay. for your time. Uh, we're going to go ahead and close it off here. Uh, for Pat, Ross, David, and myself, thanks so much, Michael, for being here. Uh, we appreciate it. Thanks so much. Thanks.